Good morning. morning. Welcome once again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We are so thankful for the hope, the certainty that God has given us in the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. And that hope we're going to see throughout the season of Easter grows in our hearts and lives. And today we see that it replaces our doubts with peace. Our doubts specifically about our own resurrection one day. We have the peace of knowing that because he lives, we also will be raised and live with him also. So we look forward to that. And that is the theme of our worship today. Our opening hymn this morning is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 15, sometimes called the great resurrection chapter of the Bible. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is the word of our Lord. Dear Christian friends, life was pretty simple in the Roman military. Just do what you're told. Just do what you're told. So here in Jerusalem... During the Passover, soldiers were there to help keep the peace. Whatever that would take. Just do what you're told. And they were told that the guy who had been crucified on Friday, well, his Galilean fishermen disciples, they might try to come and steal his body away and then go and tell everyone that he had risen from the dead. And it would just cause more chaos. So, that's how they came to be guarding this tomb. He could remember the earth shaking on Friday. And the eerie, prolonged darkness in the middle of the day. But now the guy was dead. Surely, no Galilean fisherman... Not even a crowd of Galilean fishermen would be any match for a group of Roman soldiers. But then the earth shook again, didn't it? More earthquakes, he remembered thinking. But instead of darkness, it was the brightest light that he had ever seen. It was like a person, but radiant, and just like that, it rolled the stone of that tomb away, which normally took several men to do. He wanted to cry out, but he found that he couldn't even speak. He was shaking, and then everything did go black. He passed out. How embarrassing. He remembered coming to again on the ground of all places, and he looked, and the tomb was empty. How could they have failed? It was supposed to be such an easy job. What kind of punishment would he and his fellow soldiers face? And they ran off to the Jewish leaders to explain what they had seen with their own eyes. And all the other soldiers confirmed it as well. But to his surprise, to his surprise, he felt the Jewish leaders placing a large sum of money into his hands. And to his confusion, they started giving him a different story to tell. They told him, say 
that the man's disciples did come in the middle of the night, after all, and they stole the body while all of you soldiers were sleeping on the job. He wanted to object, right? But oh, the weight of the money in his hands and the promise from the Jewish leaders to keep them out of trouble if Pontius Pilate should hear about it. Do what you're told. They knew that lesson well. Surely these leaders knew what would help keep the peace among their own people. And so, even with the image of that angel burned into his mind, and the stone having been rolled away and the empty tomb, all that he had seen, even with all of that burned into his mind, he did what he was told. They all did, just as they were told, and spread that story. Fast forward to our text today, written in about 55 AD. Paul, once the doubter-in-chief, if you will, who worked zealously to help propagate that same false story about Jesus that the soldiers were, had now, by the time of the writing of this letter, become, been a Christian for about 20 years. And the resurrected Jesus had appeared to him also. And just think about that. Changed this persecutor of Christians into the apostle who would bring the good news to the Gentiles. In the verses before us, he points to Jesus' resurrection no less than eight times. And that is because he wants us to have the peace that only Jesus' resurrection can give. The peace that it gave him as well. Now, the Corinthians, in Greek culture there in Corinth, you kind of didn't really buy into a bodily resurrection from the dead. That was kind of nonsense as far as you were concerned. And, and even many of the great thinkers in a place like Athens where Paul spoke, they, they listened to Paul, they liked to hear new ideas, but then they started sneering at him as soon as he talked about the resurrection from the dead. Nevertheless, a Christian congregation formed there in Corinth and yet, over time, some of them started to teach the rest of the Christians there that regardless of what Jesus may have done, there was no such thing as a resurrection from the dead for any of them. It wasn't going to happen. That was nonsense. It was foolishness. They doubted it. So for them, what Jesus did only had implications for this life and as long as any of them would live. As with the Corinthians, the pressure of culture always presses in against our Christian faith, no matter where we are and no matter when we live. In some places, yes, it's outright persecution and threat of physical harm, but in other places, it's way more subtle. Right? For example, many Christians in America would say perhaps that when a loved one dies, they, their, their spirit goes to heaven and maybe they get wings and turn into an angel or something like that. You see fly-high window stickers all over the place, don't you? Yeah. And yet, the Bible doesn't say or imply any such thing for us that we turn into angels, that we exist forever as just a spirit floating around. And yet, many take it as a peaceful, comforting idea. The idea, however, is connected to a denial of a bodily resurrection, just like what the Corinthians were struggling with. And this way of thinking, when you think about it, it comes easy to us because it agrees with the things that we have seen with our own eyes, right? That dead people stay dead, right? They're, they uh, decay in the ground or they are reduced to ashes if they're cremated or something like that. And so it's hard to see that and to picture that person being whole and standing in front of us and talking with us again. It just doesn't seem possible. And so it's easy to think of people just going and becoming angels, getting wings, and things like that. 
even though the Bible says nothing of the sort. The portion of Paul's letter before us makes us ask what story we believe and which one we will tell with our lives and with our words. The story that the Roman soldiers were paid handsomely to spread or the story that made even zealous opponents of Christ, like the Apostle Paul, turn 180 degrees and then risk life and limb and comfort and treasure to speak and write the words before us today. Which one do we believe? Let's look again at verse 12. It says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. For if the dead, now this is fast forward to verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. In other words, Paul is saying it is not compatible for you to say that, well, yes, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead on that Sunday morning, but as far as a, a bodily resurrection for myself, that's not necessarily something that will happen. Those two things don't go hand in hand. They don't synchronize. They don't complement one another. They are opposed to each other. Paul continues in verse 17. It says, And if Christ has not been raised then your faith is futile. And even worse yet, you are still in your sins. In other words, if we don't really believe in a bodily resurrection from the dead, then that means that Jesus hasn't rose physically from the dead. And if we don't believe that, then our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior is pointless. It's pointless for you to be sitting here today and listening to this. Your whole Christian faith is a waste of your time. We gain nothing from it, because why? If Christ has not been raised, we are still in our sins. That means that Jesus' death on the cross then wouldn't have paid for our sin. Our debt before God would still be outstanding before him. And and how can Paul go this far? How can he say all of this? Well, Because of Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, right? That's the reason that there's death. Death isn't just, you know, a, a, a part of the way that the world is. It's a direct result of us having sin inside of ourselves. God said, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. So physical death is one of those realities that is a direct result of having sin in us. And if Jesus didn't actually overcome physical death himself, then what that means is that we will not either. Then we won't either. And that would mean, this is the worst thing, that we're still condemned before God. That's what it would mean. So you can see how Jesus' resurrection is a big deal for our Christian faith. And Paul's bringing the Corinthians back to that. He wants them to focus on that so they don't lose this. So in denying, think about that, in denying our own bodily resurrection, the Corinthians were actually robbing themselves of the greatest peace that they could possibly have had. They were thinking to themselves, perhaps, that, well, it's, it's more peaceful for my mind to not think about a resurrection from the dead, right? I just don't want to think about that. But they're robbing themselves, then, of the greatest peace, and that is that death has been defeated, and you will not remain in the grave. Right? And we're still, so if we follow on down this way of thinking, if I say there is no resurrection from the dead, then that means Jesus hasn't risen from the dead. That means that I'm still in my sins. And, verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. So those who, who died, believing in Christ, they're, they're lost. 
at the death of a fellow believer, then what that would mean is that there's truly nothing else to celebrate than what they perhaps experienced in this life and accomplished in this short life, which honestly is what many funerals in the world have become, right? It's just a, a, a memory of the accomplishments that they had in their life and maybe some good memories of, of things that they did and, and things that we remember about them, uh, and that's it. Maybe you've heard it referred to as a celebration of life, right? And the understanding is, well, celebrating the life that they had. But as a Christian, that's not what it is. When your brother and sister in Christ dies, right, and we have a celebration of life, what are we thinking of? The life to come. The life to come. Which will last far longer than the time you ever had with them here and will be a million times better than the best moments you ever had with them here. Paul writes in verse 19, again, he says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied more than all men. In this world, it is very easy for us to live each and every day as though we deny an actual bodily resurrection from the dead as Jesus promised. You might think, well, how? How so? Well, oftentimes we get so caught up in and overwhelmed by and anxious pursuing all the passing stuff of this life. And our goals even are so easily fixed on things in this life that it's as though we expect nothing more. It's as though we expect nothing better. That, that, that the things in this life and the experiences in this life and our situations in this life are the, are the greatest peace that we could possibly have. But friends, that is not true. If that is all our Christian faith is, then we deserve to be pitied more than all men. But that, of course, is not what we have. So, we have to ask ourselves here, what news do we believe? That this life is all that there is? Or that the longest and happiest part of our physical lives is still to come and only after we die and are raised again or if the Lord returns first, lifts us up and glorifies us then? What do we believe? And you know, none of us like to have our hopes raised only to be disappointed again, right? We don't like that feeling. So maybe, maybe that plays a role in why we kind of shy away from focusing on a physical, bodily resurrection from the dead. Even when we go to a funeral and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. right? And we we tend to only dwell on on the soul being with the Lord in heaven. And maybe part of that is because we don't want to be disappointed. We don't, in a way, want to expect too much. But friends, the truth is that thinking this way expects too little. It expects too little from your God. Think about that. On a daily basis, does it make sense Just think about your past week. If you believe that Jesus' resurrection means your bodily resurrection, how many of the things that you worried about and lost sleep over this past week make sense? Hmm. (laughs) Uh, Not a lot. Not a lot for me, right? What do we believe? The hope that Jesus' very real bodily resurrection from the dead gives you is not just for the short number of days that you have here in this world. That hope grows in your heart and life. Each day, it brings you closer, not to the day merely when your soul is floating around in heaven, but closer to the day when God will raise you up, body and soul flesh and bone, 
to live forever in a new world, in a new creation, in his glorious presence forever. Now there is peace that you will never find in anything or any situation in this world. As Jesus said to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. If you believe in Jesus' resurrection from the dead, then believe in your own resurrection from the dead because that's part of what he accomplished there in his resurrection for you. The world may pity us oftentimes in our limitations and our apparent weaknesses, but our hope, friends, extends beyond just this life. No matter what your life looks like, by the way, should we lose all of our wealth and our health and our friends, should our lives in this world look utterly unpeaceful, we have lost nothing compared to what Jesus has won for us and what is coming for us physically. And should we, in contrast, gain lots of wealth in this world and stay healthy all of our days and be surrounded by friends and family right up until the end, all of that even together cannot hold a candle to the glory and lasting peace of being raised physically to eternal life with him. Look at the impact that this truth had on a guy like Paul. He risked life and limbs, sometimes went without food and shelter just to tell one more soul about the hope of Christ's resurrection being more than for just this short life. It gave Paul peace that carried him through everything that the world could throw at him, even a lot of stones, by the way. (laughs) Think of all the enemies of Paul and of Jesus that were changed, all the eternities that were changed by God's grace as Paul shared what Jesus had done, giving hope that is more than for just this life. And then think about how this hope, the hope of your own resurrection that Jesus has won for you, think of how it changes the way that we see everyone around us They aren't just family and friends and neighbors and acquaintances for the joys and conveniences of this life, but they are people for whom Christ suffered, died, and rose again to give them a whole new life and a whole new body and life forever in glory. Something that no lack of peace in this world could ever destroy or take away from them. When you see people that way, doesn't it change the way that you think about them and even the way that you talk to them? Having this kind of hope for the life to come is powerful even in this life to cut through all of the pigeonholing that our culture is quickly getting caught up in. Knowing that Christ did this for someone else around you, for all people around you, helps you to see them for more than just a political affiliation or an ethnic background or an income bracket, but people who need to know that they have way more to look forward to in Christ than what they can get from their government, from their job, from their hobbies, or even from their freedoms in this life. Friends, you have such good news. You have such good news for yourself and such good news to share. You have hope that grows and gives peace unlike anything else in this world can. You have something more than the hope that we get to experience the best in this life only. You have hope that goes beyond all of the chaos of this life and gives you peace now in your heart and forever with him. Because Christ is risen, you now have peace that your faith in Jesus is not pointless. That it's not just one of many religious ideas out there. But that it actually accomplishes something. The object of your faith, Christ, has changed your eternity. 
the object of your faith means a whole new life. You know now that your faith isn't just some moral code to be followed, but so much more than that, that actually leads to something tangible and lasting, that you will physically be raised and glorified. You have the peace of knowing that the preaching that you hear about Jesus' resurrection and your own resurrection is useful and timely and practical for this world, not just for you, but for your friends and your family and your neighbors. Not merely for a better life now, a few steps to give you a better life now, but rather that it is good news that secures the best life forever. You can be certain that it is not too small of a thing for your God to raise you up body and soul and glorified, never to get sick or suffer or die ever again. You have the peace of knowing that you are not still condemned for your sins. Think about that. When guilt weighs down heavily on our shoulders and, and we feel like, oh, how could I have done that? How could I have said that? And what about all the mess that I have made in the past in my life? Because Jesus lives, you are no longer in your sins. You are justified. You are declared not guilty before God. There is now no condemnation for you because of what Christ has done. They really have been paid for. And therefore, death has also been overcome. Because Jesus physically rose, you have the peace of knowing that you will too. And that means peace for you even in the face of death. You have the peace of knowing that your friends and your family who have closed their eyes trusting in Jesus and what he has done for them, that you will see them again, body and soul, and that they are not lost to you, and that the best years that you have with them are still to come. And what you have to look forward to with them will be far beyond the best and most beautiful experiences that you ever could have had together with them in this life. Jesus rose and that means peace. That means you don't have to exhaust yourself trying to find peace in the stuff of this broken world or, or having your life work just perfectly. Your peace doesn't have to come from everything being just right because it can't be in this broken world. No, your peace today and every day comes from the very certain peace that Jesus won for you with God forever. You have peace that endures no matter how broken and battered life in this world seems because your peace is anchored in Jesus and he's not still in that grave. He has risen to prove that you will rise too. As Jesus said to Thomas and the disciples, Peace be with you. Your sins are paid for. Death is defeated. You are victorious with him. All of us now have a story to tell. Your story has now been intertwined with Jesus. Because he lives, you also will live. And that means that your story never ends and it only keeps getting better. Sadly, the Roman soldiers did what they were told. <laughs> they told the made-up story. But now you have a living Savior, and he has made you a part of his story. What story will you share this week? Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.